The Lord bless you, saints of the Most High God. Welcome again to another Bible study. It is so very good to have us all tuned in to dig into the words of our Lord Jesus. Amen. It is through his words that we can move to do the things that please God. And so every one of us as children of God have a responsibility to study the word and then to apply the word. So it's so very good that we are together getting into it. And of course, I ask that, you know, once we are through with this presentation, you know, with the teaching and so forth, that we take the time to go back over and, you know, having made our notes, go back over the notes and to make sure that the things that were discussed, that were presented, have pretty much seeped into our system so that we can take the time out to adjust ourselves, adjust our lives so that they align with the word of Almighty God. So it's always a pleasure and a great thing for us, amen, to together go through the word. Now we are still on the broad subject of the church, uh, but in terms of what we are focusing and what we have been focusing on over the last couple of weeks is the sub-area and the specific topic is the judgment seat of Christ. This is a very important doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ and the apostles of old spent time, both the apostle Paul and the apostle Paul, Peter and the Apostle John in their writings at some point outlined that that particular day is coming where the children of Almighty God will stand and sit before him and will too be judged. And we want to make sure that we do not dilute this very important subject matter. It was a critical part, an important part of the teachings of the apostles. And as we are in the church of the 21st century, so many things have been diluted, so many things have been watered down. And we want to make sure that the seriousness that we must carry, that we must take with this gospel is always maintained, knowing that a day is coming when all of us will have to give an account to Almighty God for how we treated with this great salvation or how we treated with life since we received this great salvation. Um, just by way of review, the, the basic objective of the lessons that we have been looking at, we wanted to take time to show that although we are saved and will therefore not stand before the white throne judgment of Almighty God, yes, because we know that you know, those that stand there, their ultimate end is going to be in the lake of fire. So we wanted to, as an objective, show that although we are saved, we too, as Christians, will still have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to be judged by him. In other words, as Christians, we are going to be called upon to give an account of our stewardship. And that's the objectives, the objective, sorry, the broad objective of this subject on the judgment seat of Christ. We will stand before God. We will stand before our Lord Jesus Christ and we will have to, every one of us that are saved, give an account for how we lived our lives, not prior to our conversion, but since our conversion. And it is therefore important that we take stop now and recognize that we are not just sailing through life and coming to church every Sunday and if we come, we come. If we don't come, we don't come. Or if we are in a ministry, we are in it. If we're not, so be it. The only thing that I am interested in is to make it in the rapture. And we need to understand that we have been given much and much is going to be required of us. And we are expected by the Lord Jesus 
to use what we have and the time that we have wisely. And so I think it is very important. It is a very important matter of doctrine that all of God's children, all of us understand and appreciate clearly this subject area of the judgment seat of Christ. In our previous lessons, we had outlined that we are not saved by grace, but having been saved, we are saved unto or we are saved to continue in good works. So while it is not good works that save us because we are saved by the grace of God without any works at all. And once we accept the salvation plan and we do our part and work with what God has asked us to do to be saved, then there is absolutely nothing in terms of works that would have allowed for us to be saved. So salvation is a free gift from God and we just move to receive it. But having been saved, we are expected to do good works and as Christians to do the best and to be the best that we can be. And that is a concept that we must not lose. To lose that concept it gives us the sense that we are just going through and for many it is a kind of less a fair way, an attitude that yes, if I do it, I do it and if I don't, I just don't. But we need to understand that our Christian life is certainly much, much more than that. We had established that the Lord in judging us, we are going to be judged and in judging us, we can be sure that the Lord is going to be fear in his judgment. We can be sure that the Lord is going to be thorough in his judgment. Uh, we know that the judgment is going to also be impartial because of who is doing the judging. And we can also be sure that it is going to be an individual affair. So it's not a matter that we are going to stand as a body, the church, faith chapel, or whatever the name of the church or the organization. It's not going to be a corporate judgment. And this group didn't do that. It is going to be individual. And we have gone through all of those scriptures already and we had made the point. So we just by way of, of review, I wanted to touch on those things. All right. So that being the case, and we are clear that a judgment is coming for the saints. We are clear that we are going to be called upon to give an account of our stewardship. And the Lord is going to assess us thoroughly. A number of questions naturally would arise. All right. And um, the main question, the main concern I would think of any saint of God who know that we are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on that day, any child of God would want to know uh, exactly what will Christ be looking for? What are the things that he is going to judge us on? Does the Bible have anything to say about this? Are there any things in scriptures that we can look at and extract to see if we, having known this, could put our houses in order from now? And my answer to that is yes. And this is why it is important to take the time to go through scriptures. Yes, because it's not just to go to one book or one chapter here and everything is outlined as to how we ought to live and what we ought to do, etc. We find that it's when we study the word and we're going to find here a little, there a little. And then we take that and put line upon line, precept upon precept. It is how the word is set up, how it is structured. And so we now must be wise and we must search the scriptures for in them we think we have eternal life. So all of us have a responsibility to search the scriptures. And it is as we search that we are going to see the things coming out at us. 
and we will be clear in our minds as to how it is we ought to proceed. So in the instant here, we are talking about what will Christ be looking for. Yes, he's going to call upon us to give an account. But what, are we are going to, what is it that we are going to give an account of? What is it that he's looking for? That's the legitimate question. And we are going to drill into it right now. Because the things that he is looking for are set out in scriptures. Makes no sense that we call ourselves Christians and we don't read the word. And we don't study the word. Or we are not tuned in to Bible study. We are going to be anemic. And none of us can ever use the excuse, Lord, I did not know. Why didn't you know? I didn't go to Bible study. I didn't read my Bible. If we make it in, it is going to be the lamest of lame in terms of excuse that any man could ever give. Lord, I didn't know. We think that will take us out of the fire. But no, it won't. It will only make things feel even more remorseful to us as Christians, to see what the Lord would have been providing for us and what he had in store for us up there. And then when we look back and see what we did for him here, nothing. We don't read his word. We don't study. We're not into anything. We don't apply ourselves to anything. I submit to us, saints of God, let us understand that this thing is so very serious. Forget about all those that say, oh, it is just a, a straight, smooth walk through the park. Of course, it is a smooth walk through the park, but it is a whole lot of issues and a whole lot of ditches and a whole lot of mountains and a whole lot of things that we are going to be confronted with. And we just have to trust God and go through. But we must know what it is from scriptures that the Lord expects of us. And once we understand that, and then move to live the word, live to do his will, to fulfill those expectations, I am sure that uh, things will work out for all of us. Oh, I am so sure. But we must first know. So the question is, what will Christ be looking for? Let me take us to the screen right at this time, and then we are going to uh, take our time and go through bit by bit so that we unless and i believe there are about we can easily extract a, about eight or ten basic things these are the fundamental things these are the things that when we look at them it is what christian living is all about and it is something that we must understand when we were saved we were not just save to walk around and tell everybody that I have been baptized in Jesus' name or I have been filled with the Holy Ghost and you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, the weakness in part, crucial. Move beyond our being saved. Move beyond our getting the Holy Ghost, our getting baptized in Jesus' name. We have to move beyond that. And in moving beyond that, there's a twofold approach. There is one where we go tell in terms of witnessing and there is one where we live so that our lives become a witness. Yes? And while we witness and we tell and we issue forth words so that people can hear and understand and accept, then there is another aspect to our Christianity, which is living the way that God wants us to live. And it is important that we understand that saints of the Most High God. So, what is it that Christ will be looking for? We are going to look at that right now. And we are going to go, there's about, as I said, about 10 things. And they are right there in scriptures. And we are going to go through them one by one as quick as we can. Amen. So let's turn our attention to the screen. Now I'm sure that all of us, all of us want to hear, well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant. No doubt. There is not a Christian that I know that don't want to hear those words. But can I submit to us tonight, saints of God, that it is not merely because we are saved and when the trumpet sound, we make it in the rapture. It is not just the fact that we are saved that it will cause us to hear those words that we want to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful. Notice the term that is used. 
good and faithful. Take that term into consideration. Take those two words into consideration. Good, faithful. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You see, you will hear those terms, that term being said to you as a child of God when indeed we have been found to be faithful. But are we really faithful? And all we need to do is to introspect right now. All we need to do is to look at where we are and what we are doing right now. And we can answer ourselves. Nobody don't, don't need to give that answer to you. We can answer ourselves. And so I want to submit to us that we take that serious. Now there will, as I said before, be a thorough judgment. And that judgment being done, it will expose good things that we have done. It will expose bad things that we have done. It will expose inner motives. It will expose our private thoughts. We have looked at these things before. And there no doubt that it is going to be a, a, a meticulous exercise that the Lord will take us through. Now, there are folks that believe that, oh, all that I want is to make it in. Once I slip in, um, I will be fine. And of course, ultimately, you will be fine. But it is more than just slipping in. And I can assure you, if the Lord is taking us through that process, he knows why he's taking it through and why he's taking us through the process. And if he's saying that there's going to be a time when we are going to be rewarded, there is a time coming when he is going to express his sincere thanks and repay us for what we would have done in this life, it means he knows the kind of joy that we are going to experience upon receiving from him and hearing the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He knows it's going to be that time of joy because we would have done good. But then also remember that he said, we are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account, every man, for the deeds that we have done, whether good or bad. So there are some that would have been doing bad that is going to stand before him. And hey, I don't think you're going to feel the same way. I don't think we are going to feel the same way as those who would have been getting the accolades for their great faithfulness to the Lord while they were here, if we were not faithful, if we were not consistent. So I want us to be clear in our understanding, saints of the Most High God, that we will be there. Yes, nobody's going to be slipping in and sit in the back seat. And of course, Jesus looks around and sees everybody in the house. No, no, no. You, nobody will just slip in and you know just blend in with the crowd and nobody realize that hey see me around the back here no 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 every one of us and we said it last week the the records are going to be taken out yes so once we make it in make no mistake there's no back seat no front seat no side seat no corner to hide in we are there we will stand before him and that is something that we need to 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 be clear about it is going to happen that way. Now, we know some things already. Since we started the sessions, we know already that our thoughts is going to examine. We know already that the things that we have done is going to examine. We know already that the things that were not done is going to be brought up. Because why didn't we do these things? And we know from the word that we were supposed to do them. Down to the very things that we say, our speech, the words that utter from our lips, the idle time and the idle words and the lying words and the deceiving words, brothers and sisters, they are going to come up again. Make no mistake about it. We need to be very careful with what we engage in, even as we are here within the church of Jesus Christ. All of this since our conversion. The point I'm making is, prior to our being saved, we would have been thinking all the evil things. We would have been saying all kind of illeg illegitimate things. Uh, words that are, would tear people down. Words that will cause people to de become depressed. We would have said a lot of things. Things that we should do, we wouldn't do and wouldn't feel anyway. That's before we are saved. That is not going to come up 
the judgment seat of Christ. But what will come up at the judgment seat of Christ are the things done in our body in this life since our conversion, since we were saved. And then all of the above will input into the ultimate outcome when we stand before Christ. So our thoughts, uh, the things that we did, the things that we didn't do, the things that we said, uh, those unkind words, those things that were deceptive uh, to cause people to go astray. Oh, brethren, beloved, all of these things will have an input in the final outcome when we stand before the Lord Jesus. And so it is very important that we understand and recognize that. No, no, I can tell you, saints of God, even as I go through and would have put these points together, I, it, it makes me uncomfortable. It, in fact, it makes me feel a little scared. And this is me as an individual. I can be a little bit, and I feel as I go through a bit of nervousness, probably like some of you or all of you or hopefully all of us because that nervousness comes when we start to realize and to understand and to appreciate how deep and how serious this thing is. It is important that we understand that these things are going to come back. It is going to come back to us. Never lose sight of the fact that the value of the things that we do, the value of a deed, the value of it, how valuable it is, it depends upon the attitude of the heart. And that, that's a little summary term that I want us to hold close to our chest. The value of a deed, the value of something that you and I do, depends upon the attitude of our heart in doing that particular thing. Yes? So it is very, 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 very important that we embrace that. We can do things but have the wrong motives. We can do things but the attitude is just miserable and rotten. And we can't just say, well, I did it. Well, it is not the fact that we do it that we are going to be rewarded for that by itself. No, but if we do it with ulterior motives, where will be the reward? If we do it with an attitude that I didn't want to do it, but they forced me to do it, uh, and we are going to look at something very shortly to show that that is not really how it goes. It is important, and I say it again, embrace that little sentence. The value of a deed depends upon the attitude of the heart, and we need to cultivate as children of God, walking with him right now, cultivate an attitude, a mindset, a heart that is such that we desire and we want to and we fight to do the things that we know will please Almighty God. Now, having said that, there are folks who would have wanted to do more. Yes? They would, have, they would be happy to take on new challenges for the Lord. They would have been happy to go out more often and do their witnessing and all. It would have been their great delight to be in Sunday school teaching or something for the Lord. But because of some legitimate reason, some limitation, it could be illness, it could be that they, whatever the reasons are, they are unable to do it. But legitimate reason that is justified both in your own eyes and in the eyes of Almighty God. God, understand that. God, I want us to know, will in fact take into account our desires. Because sometimes we desire to do a thing and we would have moved to do it, but because of a physical or a mental limitation, we can't do it. Believe it, saints of God, I'm submitting to you that just the desire to do it is something that the Lord is going to take into consideration as he deals with us. Yes, as he puts things in place for judging us and bringing us into account. Now, I want us to use as an example the, the subject of giving. 
right? When it comes to giving, Paul stresses that the attitude when we give has to be right. Notice that in some of his writings, you know, he talks about God loves a cheerful giver. And if you're giving, we, we must give willingly. We must not give grudgingly. So these are all attitudinal issues. These are all things, and it is important, do not take these things lightly. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. What is it that Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12? If we are willing, if it is in our mind and our heart, it is accepted according to what you have and not according to that you don't have. No, if you, it is in your heart to give a thousand dollars, God is going to look at that heart and God is going to know who you are and know that if you had a thousand dollars, you would have given it. But you really don't have the thousand dollars. But God sees the heart. And this is why I'm telling us that God is so sorry. You know? He searched the heart and the rain. It's the deep part and the inside God is looking at. And a man can give a $50 in the offering plate. And it's really $50,000 he gave. Because it's in his mind and heart. Oh, I wish I could give to God. I wish I had. I wish I had the business that I desire. Because if I did, I would have taken up $50,000 right now. And I would have given it to the Lord. And God sees that heart. And we, while we don't know, and we might say, boy, that's a good desire. God knows his heart because God sees it. And God knows that if he had it, he would give it. You know that God used that man's desire. And God counts it as if he did. Once that willing mind, once that willing heart is there. Yes, it is not that you don't have it. It's not that you have it. It is that you don't have it. So God is not going to use the fact that you don't have it and say you didn't give. He's going to look at the heart and say the heart was willing but you don't have it. He's going to accept it as if you had it. And this is something that I want us to understand. And that's why I am stressing again that the attitude of the heart is very, very important sins of God in everything that we are doing for Christ, both in the house and in our general walk with Almighty God, the attitude, the motive, our reasoning for executing anything that comes as a result of our walk with Almighty God. It is important that we have a right spirit and, a, and, a, and an attitude that God can look at and say, this man, this woman, has the right heart and accordingly he will judge us so note 2nd Corinthians 8 verse 12 now I want to make the point and, and, and I think what I just said covers these two things that we have here if you give a hundred dollars but would give much more if you had it you will be rewarded for more than the amount that you give that scripture above is speaking to that if you give a hundred, but you know in your heart of heart that if you had a hundred thousand, that is what you would have given. And God looks into your heart because he can see it. And then he also knows motive. God knows that you would have. He is going to reward you. Not for the hundred that you give, but for the hundred thousand that you would have given. We have to understand that. So it is not merely what we do, saints of God. It is what is behind it, what God is seeing in our attitude, what God is seeing in our hearts. Do not discount the attitude, the heart, the mind of the believer. These are the deep things that will make the big difference. What we see on the outside, that is for men like me to look at and say, boy, this person is so kind. And I might feel that you are kind and you are not. Or a man can seemingly be mean and I can say boy this man is tight and he is not we see things in a particular way but as men we are never right because we are only looking at the outward things but where God is concerned God knows we see a man give $10 we say boy that man give $10 in God's 
a diary that man could give a million dollars, even though it's ten dollar input in the plate. It is what the attitude is. It is where the heart is, and that point is important for us to grasp. On the other hand, if you intended to give fifty dollars, but by mistake instead of taking what a fifty dollar is a five thousand come out, you know when it fold up, it probably look like a five hundred or probably even a fifty dollars. So if you take out was reaching for a 50 and a 5,000 came out and you drop it in the bucket. And afterwards you found out, Lord, there's the 5,000 going in on. All right, it's gone already. I can't even go back through the hassle for take back the 5,000 because they're gone. You make it stay. And in your mind you feel, boy, I give $5,000. God Almighty, I shall be rewarded. Let me tell you, even if you're rewarded, it's not the $5,000 you're going to be rewarded for. It is the 50 understand the concept you want to give 50 and by error you give 5,000 you're not going to be rewarded for the 5,000 you're going to be rewarded for the 50 understand the concept it is a matter of the heart it is a attitude issue and we have to make very sure that we fully understand that now there's a scripture in the book of Saint Mark Saint Mark chapter 12 and it, it, it brings out clearly the point that we are trying to make here saint mark chapter number 12 verses 43 and 44 it brings out clearly the point that we are trying to make here and i'm telling us you know when we look at these scriptures and we are looking at the things that we are saying we are seeing where the lord is literally preparing us for the day when he will judge us he's literally telling us that this is the kind of attitude. This is what I will be looking out for. And I'm giving us a hint here. So here is the scripture. St. Mark chapter 12, verse 43. And he called unto him his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. Verse 44 she has cast in more for all they did cast in of their abundance for all they did cast in of all their abundance but she of her out of her need did cast in all of her living what was jesus saying although and the story is essentially this here was a lady that had very little. The little that she had, she decided, because there are some things that the Jews did, and we will touch on it very shortly. Uh, it, it, it was sacrosanct to them. They were known for giving alms, for prayer, and for fasting, and we'll touch at it very shortly, because it's one of the things the Lord is going to be looking out for where we are concerned. And they give alms. This lady went to give she didn't have much to give, right? But of the little that she had, she take from it and give. In fact, when she gave, she gave everything that she had. A person that give, gives everything, understand that I'm going to have nothing after I do this. But because of the cause, because it is for God and God required it, etc., etc., this lady take up out of her nothingness. She take up the little what she have and she give it. Now let us say it was a farden. She gave her farden, which was a small amount. But that is all she had. In fact, it was everything that she had. And she cast it. She gave it into the treasury or gave it for the needs of those that are needy. But then another person who had it came in. And out of his whole abundance, he took up a big sum and he drop it into the plate also. And he gave for the needy. So they both gave to the needy. They both gave to a worthy cause. It's just that this lady just give a dime and this gentleman, this rich man, might have given probably him showing a million dollars because he's wealthy. He had abundance according to the scripture. And out of the abundance, he gave. So he might have given a million but then this lady just gave her like a small $10 coin. Maybe it's all she had. And I'm just using our dollar terminology here. She probably just gave her 
You know, that is what some, all some people can find. But Jesus said something very significant here in the scripture that we just looked at in Mark 12. He said that this lady, verse 43, this lady literally in the eyes of Jesus Christ, this poor widow has cast in more than all they that have cast into the treasury. How can it be? Because a little bit is like a ten dollar she give. And they might have given a million and more. But the Bible saying Jesus said she cast in more. It is not the physical amount, brethren. It is the attitude. And that is the point that I want to make to us. And this is what, is, this is what the Lord is saying. The heart is what counts. People can do a lot of things. Folks can give a lot of things. Folks can be very benevolent. And at the end of the day, there will be people who were very helpful, very benevolent, gave to every cause, always present. And at the end of the day, they might still lose it all. Why? But I did give. Why? But I was always there. It is not just showing up. It is not just giving. See the scripture here? I want us to read it over and over. The attitude of the heart is what is important. Although she might have given a $10 coin or a $1 or the smallest denomination in her day, and the others give massively more, Jesus himself said that lady gave more than them. Very significant. Well, listen to me now. It is this Jesus that said that, that is going to sit on the throne to judge us at the judgment seat of Christ. He, what he has just done is to give us a glimpse of how he will be looking at things and he will be assessing things when we sit before him. We have just gotten a glimpse of what Christ will be looking for. Not the thing given, but what was behind it, the attitude. And this is a very important, important point that we must not overlook. Uh, very, very important. Then he's also he, he's, he's, he's helping us you know, to get it properly. And, and there's another scripture. Right in the book of 1 Peter 2 verse 5, he also as lively stones are built upon a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Look, anything that we are going to be offering up to God as we build the spiritual house, as we do the different things that we do building this house. You remember when we met last week, I said that is only one foundation and Jesus Christ has established that foundation. But then we are the ones that will be building up that wall and carrying up everything. And we do that with the good works, with the things that we do. And those works, we have to make sure that everything is good as we do them. And we have the right spirit, we have the right motive. You know, the, the thoughts behind them, what motivates us to do it is correct. Because we can do them up because of self. We can do them to be seen. We can do them so that we, we get the accolades and so forth. And what we said last time is that if we do it with those motives, if we do it with ulterior motives and with an intention to be seen so that we can be promoted there or we can be promoted there, I submit to us, and we have gone through that, our rewards will not stand. That's a structure that is being erected with wood and with hay and with stubble. But Jesus is saying that we must take care that when we're building now, we as lively stones must build this spiritual house. And when we do it now, ensure that we use good material like gold and silver and precious stone. But even at our best sometimes, many times, at our best, we cannot be good enough. So Peter was saying here that all that we are doing do them with the right motive. Do them with the right spirit, you know. Because what we are going to do now, you know, we are going to offer them up. 
and Jesus is going to take it and make it acceptable to God. So it's not we do what we are doing and we are saying, Lord, I, I, I'm doing my best for you. And as we do that and we try to do what we do with the right mind, we are basically taking what we are doing and putting it into the hands of the Lord Jesus. If we are going to teach a Sunday school class, I want, I believe, I submit, we should pray. We should take it seriously. We should put it before God. We should ask for his guidance. We should ask him to touch the mind so that we can take self out of the way. If we are asked to preach, if we are asked to lead a song, we should pray and put it before God because these are things that are being used. If we are asked to go visit someone in the hospital that is sick and we go, pray before you go. Understand that these are good works and it is going to stand up before you again. However, if we go to do the thing and we say, God Almighty, help me. I'm going to visit Brother John. I'm going to visit Sister Sue. Just use this as something that will bring glory to your name. And you go and you encourage that saint and you encourage that unsaved and you talk to them about God and so forth. And you step out of that place and you say, Jesus, use it for your glory. Make self be slain. Every time we practice saints of God to, to use the term, understand the term, and realize how potent it can be. God takes self out of the way. The more we develop an attitude to take our self out of the way. Because it is easy for self to come in. You know, boy, I go to five people. I'm going to make the congregation know that I visit five people in hospital. I want this group to know that I have gone over to there to that homeless man. And I drop off ten bucks of food. And everybody applaud you. That will be your reward. And we're coming down to that in a while. But if we can have an attitude where we pray. Every time we're doing something. And, and we're doing it for God. We say, God, take the glory. What the Lord Jesus is going to do now is to take it and then he's going to do what he must do now to put it into the, because you would have done your best, I would have done my best. He then puts it into an acceptable form and present it to himself, present it to God and it will be seen as a great work done and you will be greatly rewarded. And so he's helping us to get it right. So we are see the scripture there in St. Mark and we see what he's looking at. It's not the amount because you can give a lesser amount and be rewarded for a greater thing. So it's not just the amount. Yes, it is the attitude. Understand that. And as I said just now, understand also that when we do the thing, have the right attitude that put Christ first and put the Lord into the mix, into the mix so that he will take it and fix it for us and offer it up to himself, offer it up to God. And it will then be seen as a pure and well-deserved work that we did here. And it is very important, saints of God, that we understand that. Now, having said that and given that small little glimpse of how the Lord will look at things, not just the amount, but what is behind it? Can you, as I said repeatedly, and I'm saying this for emphasis because of where we are going now. She gave a small amount, yet it was seen by the Lord. For us, she would have only given a dollar. That person gave a million. We, we, we elevate that man or that woman who gave the million. We down here, we, put a, we get a little iron chair for that lady and dust it off, of course, but we thank her for the, the one dollar. But then we get a big soft chair for the man who gives the million or the woman who gives the million because they give so much. And yet, you see what Jesus just said? He said, but that lady gave more than him. She should have gotten the soft chair. But no, we do things as men a certain way because we really can't look at what really matters. What the Lord is saying, he's not going to be doing that and looking at what is happening on the outside. He's looking at the genuineness with which things were done. And his giving rewards is standing at the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to be drilling beyond the flesh. He's going to be drilling beyond what was done on the outside. And he's going to be looking on the inside. Deep, deep down. And on the basis of what he sees and knows there, then he will give each of us what we deserve 
And so that is very, very important. So having said that, what are the things that Jesus will be looking for to judge us? At the start, I said we would have had about 10 things. And we are going to take our time and we are going to go through. Because that, at the end of the day, that is what really matters. Having said all oh, that we said over the past couple of weeks, what is it that Christ will be looking for? Number one, coming up with the scriptures. One, our joyful acceptance of injustice. What does that mean? What exactly does that mean? Now, Jesus made it clear about the reward connected with bearing insults for his name. You know, as children of God, saints of God, we, as we go through, we are called upon to suffer for him. People call us all kind of derogatory things. It's not so bad here in Jamaica because the worst they do to us out here is call us grease can. You know, when you look at when I was just saved and so forth, and the hottest thing anybody could do to me is say, boy, you're you not know, Christian, you're a grease can. And I felt hollow on the inside because I felt that I was not a, they, they were not seeing me as a Christian. And it was, I really felt bad because I was called a grease can um, in those days. Of course, trying to be with the crowd, so I, a foot in and a foot out. And that little foot that I had out, just to be a part of them, them see one turn around and call me grease can and so forth. I'm not a Christian. So you see, many times that sins, you know, we have to be careful because we, we try to straddle both worlds and think that we want to not seem to be odd and an oddball and so forth and do what we do that people don't call us anything and insult us or think us to be weird and, and crazy because we go to a church that, you know, no, no, no. Jesus Christ is literally looking, right? He is literally looking out for us to accept joyfully when people do us injustice. But God going to reward us for that? Well, let us go into the word because these are the things that we are, we are presenting to you what he will be looking for what he is going to be rewarding us for. And I said, number one, the joyful acceptance of injustice. Now, Matthew chapter 5, 11 and verse, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely because of me or for my name's sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Virgin beloved, Jesus is saying that if men cast insults at you and persecute you, casting insults me, calling you names, all kind of things that are derogatory. We don't have it bad here in Jamaica or in this hemisphere. But you want to go to some of our Christian brethren in other places and see some of the things that they go through for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notwithstanding, even here in our island home, Jamaica, there are folks who have derogatory things to say about us that name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that Jesus is simply saying that if men do this against you from me, because of me, they insult you and then persecute you. They call you names and all, all of those type of things. If they do this because of me, there is a reward for you. But what you must do is continue to serve me. So you, at your workplace, you may be fired. And you have people who are fired when they find out that they, they can't work on weekends. Or that you have people who don't get a promotion. You are looked over, bypassing the job because of your faith. They don't promote you. They feel that if they want to cut a corner, you are there. It's not going to happen. So they keep you at a distance and so forth. Understand what I'm saying, brethren and beloved. You can do a couple of things. And we're going to look at the scriptures as we go down into later. We're going, you can do a couple of things. 
You can, you can be swearing and cursing at your supervisors or your managers and all. You can be carrying on and say, look how long I've been here. No, we're not saying that we cannot speak up for our rights. And we cannot speak up because the working condition is poor. That's a different thing. But having done that, what if nothing else happened? Well, we can leave the job. But then what if we stay? If we are there, we cannot sully our reputation as a Christian, as a child of God. We cannot bring into disrepute the Lord Jesus Christ. He is saying that at anywhere that you are, there will be a time, there will be a season when you are going to be called upon to, well, accept all kind of atrocities for his name's sake. And blessed will you be if it happens. So understand that if these things are happening to you because of your Christianity, because of your conviction, right? You're not going to be involved in a dishonest and illicit affair as a worker in a particular organization. You're going to do what is right. What is it that Jesus said that we must do in the scripture? Rejoice for your reward is great in heaven. A lot of Christians is totally unaware, oblivious of the fact that there is a reward for them when folks mock them, when folks say all kind of things and insult them, when folks fight against you at work and you get fired. And many times this is happening just because of the fact that they have found out that you are a child of God. Understand, it is not for you to take up a machete and for you to go call your bad man brother or sister or uncle. No, no, no. You, anything that as a child of God you do, you make sure, we make sure that we maintain our Christianity, maintain the faith, maintain our walk with God. And if at the end of the day we have to walk away, then we must walk away. But here is what Jesus said to do. Rejoice! For your reward is great in heaven. One, he is looking out for us to joyfully accept. As he said it, he said rejoice. They mock you, rejoice. Them insult you, rejoice. Them treat you unfairly, rejoice. Them persecute you, rejoice. So he is saying accept with joy. Be joyful and accept the injustice that is meted against you. He is looking out for that. That is going to be one of the things when we sit before him. How did you treat with it when at your workplace down there on Marcus Garvey Drive, they did this to you over the years? How did you treat with that? What was your reaction? And you said, boy, Jesus, nobody can take step on me. Okay, so you fight and you care. What did that do to my name? Seeing that you at the time was a child of God. How did they view Christianity and me? And boy, Lord, I didn't even think about that. I was just saying I don't want nobody to take step with me. So you, 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 you'd rather them not take step with you, but you will make them take step with my name. I'm telling you, saints of the Most High God, He is looking and we are going to sit before Him. We are going to stand before Him and we are going to account because He's saying you cannot be selfish. Where I am concerned, this thing is not about you. In everything that you do, you must make sure that there is something that brings glory and gives glory to my name. So I am saying to you from the scripture in St. Mark 12 that you're supposed to rejoice even though it's bitter. Even though you may shed tears at the end of the day. If you have to walk, you're going to have to walk. But make sure that when you walk, you're not bringing shame to my name you're not bringing damage to the church of the lord jesus christ because he's saying this is something that you are going to go through as somebody that bears my name so i am going to look to see how you angle when you are mocked how you angle when you are persecuted how you angle when you are insulted because of the fact that you're a christian for my name's sake and if you treat with that properly you will be greatly rewarded. Worth you rejoice in the fact that you were suffering this for my name's sake. 
you will be greatly rewarded. Saints of God, let us look closely at how we treated it, whether it is at work, whether it is at home, in the community, it don't matter where. He's looking for people who will joyfully accept injustices against them for the name of Jesus Christ. Don't fight, don't curse, don't swear. If you have to speak, nothing is wrong with speaking up for certain rights. But at the end of the day, whatever we do, however we do it, whatever we say, it must not interrupt, it must not taint the name of Jesus and the church that he started. Yes, we are going to be called to give an account for that. So bear that in mind. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Paul was writing to the Hebrews, and it was the same message he was presenting to them that Jesus made mention of in St. Mark chapter 12. The same thing. They were being persecuted, and he said, Rejoice! You will be greatly rewarded. Now, if you understand what was happening in Paul's time when he was writing to those Hebrews, if you understand what, he was, liter what was literally going on in the lives of those folks, you would be very, very, very surprised. You would be very, very surprised. Look, listen. Folks had their land taken away. At the time, you know, it was a time of the Roman rule. And the Romans were fully in charge. People did not have the convenience like we have today that if somebody does something against me or a, a, a member of parliament did something I can just go on the air and put it on nationwide or I go to the court and I do this and, and get my recourse. No. While they were there, the, the land was controlled by the Romans. If you talk out of turn, you can take your whiskey off the jail. People had servants that if you, you talk out of turn, them, them lock you up for a while before they put you back to work. It was a rough time. And then those who were Christians and became Christians now were living within that kind of society and under those societal pressures, which was the norm at the time. And so Paul, uh, Paul was literally, literally saying, Look here, don't cast away your confidence because after you got you all of those hardship, after you, they take away your land, after you did what you had to do, after you served me and you try putting things together, they just come take it away from you. Paul was saying, in the light of all of that, in the light of all of that, still maintain your confidence in God. Let's go back to the slide before. Still maintain your confidence in God. I went a little bit further and we're going to go one step backward. Right. We still want to maintain our confidence and our faith in God. So Paul was saying in, to the Hebrews, in all that they're taking away things that belong to you, in all that they're taking you and locking you up, in all that they have you as like a servant in a particular place and working you over time and it does, uh, all of these things are happening to you and you're still a Christian in that environment. Paul was saying, don't cast away your confidence and that confidence is not in man, it is in the Lord. And he said, which has great recompense of reward. So Paul talking to the Hebrews was saying, in your time of persecution, hold on. To your faith and confidence in the Lord because it will be greatly rewarded and it is the same message that Jesus had he said rejoice for your reward is great in heaven and so I want us to understand saints of God that it is extremely important that we understand and understand clearly that first thing that I have here that he will be looking out for our joyful acceptance of what? So the next slide. Our joyful acceptance of whatever 
things we go through, it is so very, very, very important. All right. Um, our cross, and I'm saying this, our cross is simply the troubles we would not have if we were not Christians. So all of us as Christians carry a cross, saints of God. All of us, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, wherever we are, all of us, we carry a cross. And the cross is not that thing that we have on our shoulder like what Jesus had to do from where he, he, he was beaten and had to walk with the cross on his back down to Golgotha. It's not physical. But anything, any trouble that we are going through now as a child of God, that if we were not a Christian, we would not have this. We would not have this kind of trouble. But because we are a Christian, they call us all kind of names. Because we are a Christian, they bypass us for the promotion. Because we are a Christian, we never get this job. And uh, look here, that is a cross that we are, you are carrying, that we carry. Different for different folks. But we all have a cross to carry. And any trouble that we would not have if we were not Christians, consider that as your cross. And Jesus is saying, when the day come and you stand before me, Whatever the cross is, whatever that cross was, if you are faithful, if you carry on, whether it was through insult, through persecution, whatever the cross was, carry on, saint of God. He's looking out for that. And it is going to be one of the things that he judges on. And so I submit to us and encourage us to be, to, 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 Whatever it is that we're going through that is troublesome because of our Christianity, do it, go through, and go through rejoicing. And you will be greatly rewarded. I will be greatly rewarded. Let us accept these troubles in Jesus' name and rejoice. And remember this, that God is watching. All right? God is watching. So we have looked at the first one from the list that I have. Joyful acceptance of injustice. The second one, the second one, financial generosity. Financial generosity. Now, many of us will appreciate and understand that money is a test of loyalty. Folks don't understand that, but it is true. We know that, and we, 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 the Bible speaks at some place, that the love of money is the root of all evil. At the same time, it says, money answereth all things. And we know generally, just from how business is conducted, that money is an important item to have so that we can transact and do what has to be done. But it is clear to one and all that money is a test of loyalty. And Jesus made note of it. He said, um, and he said unto them, and we are, at, we are into Luke 16 and verse 15, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And if we look at the scriptures above, and you realize what was the context of the statement that he was making. There was, it was a discussion surrounding money, mammon. And folks were making a whole lot of fuss Yes, a whole lot of fuss about having money. And Jesus placed it into perspective. So here again in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, he continued along the same trend. Do not lay up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth or rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy 
and where thieves do not break in or steal. So here is it that he's putting it in context now. So the scripture that we read before and this one pretty much talking about the same thing. And it's a test of loyalty. And so Jesus puts it into perspective now here at this point and says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It is important for us to understand that money is important in our every, everyday lives. Money is an important feature to all those that are conducting business. Anything that we do, money is required. Money is important. And Jesus knows that. And yet, Jesus is now coming and saying to the folks, look here, understand this basic and simple principle. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What was Jesus saying? What was the point that Jesus was bringing out? Because he knew. Remember, remember they had some bills to pay at one point, And they had to go pay their taxes. And Jesus couldn't just say, well, Stop worrying about money, man. If you don't pay the tax, make it stay. No. He provided money for them. In fact, he miraculously provided the funds for them. And said, go over there and catch a fish. And in the mouth of the fish, he have the money that you need. And, you, and they got the money and go pay for the taxes. And everything was all right. He knows the value of having money. The bills cannot be paid. Nothing can be bought. So he knows. And yet still, he was emphatic and said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What Jesus was saying is that, look here, be careful where you put your priorities. We will not be judged, brethren, solely on the basis of what we give to the church, you know, and give to the poor people, and give to missions work. And No, no, no. It goes deeper than that. And while, and the principle apply, a man can probably give $100 to mission, and he's, that $100 is much, much more than the man that gave 5,000 to mission work or to poor or so forth. But Jesus is putting it into perspective now. And one of the things that he is going to be judging us on when we stand before the white throne judgment, which is point number two, it is our financial generosity. Now, I, I want us to understand, saints of God, that all our money belongs to God. Doesn't matter that you have a hundred million dollars over there, it's not, it belongs to God. God allow you to accumulate that. It doesn't matter, it belongs to God. Yes, what we live on, what we invest, what we in inherit, all of this we are going to have to give an account to God for. What does this mean? God is going to be judging us on how we treated with our time, our talent, and our treasures. And when you talk about treasures, it's talking about the assets, the things that we have. Why will God be judging us on our assets? Why will God be judging us on money? What is it about money that God will want and seek to judge us on we have to understand that the money that we have came from him now if we invest into the kingdom if we invest and bless somebody that is poor and that is needy if we invest and help in whatever it is that your local church is doing we must do it against a certain background I'm doing this for the Lord I'm giving though I'm giving it to the church the concept and the attitude must always be scenes of God I am giving to the Lord I am giving it for the purpose of kingdom building how is that going to assist kingdom building when you give your offering when we give tithes when we give to the poor do we understand that we are actually giving back to God? Now, I happen to know that there are folks that it doesn't matter what, 
they, they, they are going to always give. And they can't, and when I say always give, you know, I don't mean every time you ask, because sometimes you just gener genuinely do not have it. But once the cause is there, and we see that this is something that is going to give glory to the God of heaven, then we are going to give because the only kind of thing that can be taken to buy a mic in church is money. The only kind of resource that can buy a box so that we can hear the singing and hear the, the preaching, the resource that is required is funds. If, so that when, when we ask, because there are times when folks will ask, there are times when a church will ask, and there are, time when a, there are times when a church will not ask. So let us say it is the regular run of the mill, and we give of our tithes, and we give of our offering. That is something that happens uh, on a consistent basis. And folks will not question it. Folks, we, we don't question that because we know we are called upon to give and we know we are giving to God and we know we are giving to the kingdom and we know our giving is causing things to happen. But I want us to see, brethren, that we're not just giving to a physical entity, which is the office, which is where pastors sit and which is where the lead. No, 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 don't look at it that way. Remember we said earlier, what is important, you know, is not just that we give. Because you can have a person that gives $2 million, you know, and it don't add up to the 5000 What another saint give? The important thing is to understand that all our money, all our treasures, our financial treasures belong to God. And so when we're giving, see it that we are giving as unto the Lord. And so let our motive, let our attitude be right. We are going to give as if we are giving to God because it is one of the things that he is going to judge us on when we stand before him on that day. Our financial generosity. Now, in giving, he said, listen now, be careful how you have things stacked up. He's not saying don't save and don't invest. But as we invest and as we accumulate, how can that money translate? How can the things in terms of financial resources that God has given to us translate into treasures in heaven? Because it's not like we have a bank up there and we can put it in that bank and it turn into a heavenly thing. How does it translate? We can use our resources and between giving to the needy, helping the poor, assisting the advancement of kingdom business, we can establish what is a worthy cause did you know that there are children right now that cannot go to school because they cannot find the school fee did you know that as an individual we can look at a school or we can go to a school and find is there any child in need that will that can't come to school because they don't have lunch money we will be surprised to find out that there are so many youngsters a young child that cannot go to school you will be surprised to find in the indigent homes so many that cannot eat every evening they have to do it every other day because that indigent home don't have enough to give to all that is in there can i tell us that we can find a way even if it is to make sure that three persons can eat once a week, we can do something with the resource that we have. I want us to look at this thing because this is something, this is something that I believe that we can take on as individuals or we can take on as a group. Because make no mistake about it, Jesus said, we have to lay up treasures and he's going to ask us to give an account for our time, our talent and our treasure. 
how can we put together? I want us to, un now when we, when we take $10,000 and we plunge it into a home for the age, when we take $10,000 and we plunge it into a school system, when we take whatever resource we have and we get together and decide that we are going to do this for this particular cause. And then when we look around and we see those old people eating, or we see them dressed in warm clothes or cool clothes or what kind of clothes, when we look around and see that the money that we invested into this particular thing has caused those little boys and girls to go to school, you know what has happened? We have just transmuted money that was in our account and take some of it and transmute it, it move from cash into something that a child, an elderly person, somebody in need is benefiting from. And all of a sudden, that now goes into your treasury in heaven and is stacking up on your name, on your account. Because you use your treasure, you use what you had to, or have to benefit somebody that don't have. All of a sudden, money that just sitting down in an account has become alive and is being used to uplift somebody else. You are going to be rewarded for that. The money in the account does nothing. Inflation is going to be a moth that is going to eat it out. The money in the account is really nothing. So long as it is there, the only thing you can say, you have it. So what a lot of folks do is constantly make money move. They call it the velocity of money. They spend it and they spend it to invest in something else and to make it grow or otherwise. As you invest to make your money grow, make sure that a part of it that you feel comfortable with is going somewhere that you can see it transmute, it move from a paper form into a form that can become eternal. And whenever you see that child eat or that old person eat or that needy one going to school or that needy one get their bag or get the prosthetic leg or whatever it is, and it happens as a result of your financial input from your treasury and benefit some of God's children, whether they saved or they are unsaved, it is now stacking up into your heavenly account and it will have eternal dividends being paid out. And that is important. So one, he is going to be judging us for how we joyfully accept injustice. Two, he is going to be judging us for our financial generosity. And we now go to point number three. What Jesus will be looking for, he is going to be looking for how hospitable we are. Our hospitality. And I bring the screen up at this time our hospitality. So it is important that we understand that these are the things that he is going to be looking for. Now, St. Matthew chapter 25 verses 35 and 36 goes directly into this particular area, hospitality. And what we are going through are the simple Things that he's going to be looking for when he is judging us. When he asks us to give account of our stewardship. So number three, hospitality. Now Matthew 25. For I was an ungod and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and ye took me in naked and you clothed me i was sick and you visited me i was in prison and you came unto me and of course the other part of this was when the folks then asked him 
But when did we see you hungry and fed you? And when, when did we see you sick and visited you? When did we see you in prison and came and looked for you? And he said, listen, in as much as you have done it to one of these, you have done it unto me, brethren beloved. And of course, of course, the scripture would have gone on. Of course, the scripture would have gone on to talk about. And I, in fact, I think we should read the full scripture. I, I want to, let us turn to it. Normally, I would have just let us jump past, but I think this one requires to just read the full context because it is, it is, I believe it is something that will bring the, the, the message across to us even more vividly. St. Matthew chapter 25 verses 35 uh, and 36 and let us read let's just read it and see exactly what it is saying for i was an ungod and you gave me meat i was thirsty and you gave me drink i was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick. And you visited me. I, I think we're going to go on to verse 37 also. And you visited me. And it goes on. Now, this is where I wanted us to. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee an ungod and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto me? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. And that is significant. That is significant. Very significant. What am I saying? Imagine that the Lord wanted a place to stay this evening. You know that we'll be fighting with each other for him to come to our house. One, one fight would have probably break out. Because everybody would want him to come to our own house. The fact is, Bridget Beloved, we can take him to our home tonight. Or we can find a lovely place for him to stay. How do we do that? Well, there are some saints. There are some folks. There are some people that are desperate. There are some situations that require some immediate input. Assist to hold somebody. Assist to keep them. These are real, real, real situations. These are things that are happening right in our midst at this time. And all I am doing now is to sensitize us, saints of God, that we can understand that because we know that he's going to be looking at some things, he's going to be looking at how we show hospitality and kindness to folks and he says that our reward will be great to show hospitality yes you see somebody that is hungry or you know of somebody that just don't have any or even if you don't know let me tell you how you and i can be involved and it is something that we are looking to do because we want not just as individuals but we want as a corporate so that everybody can play a role there are folks that are hungry Hungry don't mean that they are dying. But they eat dinner and food today and they probably eat half day tomorrow. Another day might pass with nothing and then one meal the day after. So that although they are not dying, they are in a dire strait. And that is happening to folks that are in church. But it is also happening to folks that are in some of our communities that we know of. So one of the things that we can do as part of our hospitality and part of our showing kindness is to see, because it's not, it is not all of us 
that will have funds that we can say, here is $10,000 I'm going to give every week, or here, none of us might be able to do that. But sometimes we find ourselves, and many times we find ourselves with some funds that come to us that are extra. We can say, can I give a thousand dollars towards because we are for us, we are reinitiating the food bank. For us, we are reinitiating the feeding program. Yes, and we will talk about it in a while. But while we are doing this as a church and we will address it from tithes and offering, we also feel that if folks look at their resources and see that I have an extra 500 or see that I have an extra $1,000, brethren beloved, be your brother's keeper in hospitality and kindness because this is one of the things that our Lord Jesus will be looking out at and looking out for when we stand before him. How hospitable and kind we were. So he said, when saw we thee hungry, in as much as you fed one of the hungry ones that was around you, you would have been feeding me. And he's going to judge us on the basis of that. And he has a reward for us on the basis of that. And so I want us to bear that in mind. Jesus describes, you know, that the, this kind of kindness will not escape his notice. Yes, it will not escape his notice. In, in St. Matthew 18 and verse 5, you know, he, he had a little child standing up beside him. He had a little child standing up beside him and said, Whosoever receiveth one such child in my name, receive me. Matthew 18 and verse 5. In other words, you receive this child. This child, a little child, can't take care of himself or their parents can't take care of them and them do. And you go out and you decide that you're going to help them and you help them. He said, look here, you're doing that. You're really helping me. And when you stand before me, I am going to say thank you for helping me on the day when you gave me food down by the bridge. And you're going to say, God, that did I do? When did I do that? He's going to say, you did it for this little child. You did it for that whole lady. You sent the money to buy the food for that group over there that was hungry. You did it for me. Thank you. And now here is my reward. If, you, if, if we want to please Jesus then we need to find the poor, find the physically challenged, find the lonely, find those in our midst that are in a terrible situation in terms of their accommodation. We probably might not be able to take them into our direct house, but we might be able to assist them to get into a more comfortable setting. Or maybe we are, all they require is just a mattress. You would be surprised, saints of God. And sometimes as individuals, you might not know, but as a church, we know because these things come to us. The people from the community come to us. Saints come to us quietly. I say, please, I can't even make... And you see, when we do these things, the, at the heart of it, at the heart of it, Jesus said, don't make your right hand know what your left hand is doing. At the heart of it, we don't have a call and go on in the mountain and say, I help that sister over there or I help that brother. When you're doing these things and giving your arms, and do, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. So that is where the reward is going to come in. Because when you do these things and nobody does, if people know you, know, they will reward you. You know what your reward will be? Their acclaim, their, 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 their thanks. And they say, you're a great brethren. You're a great sister. You're a great brother. Your reward you would receive here. But Jesus said, when you do it, don't do it and make nobody know. Because when you do it quietly, it is happening. But he's seeing it. Even though nobody else don't see. And for whatever reason, this is what Jesus look at as genuine response. When you do it and nobody knows. When you give and nobody sees. And this is why I am convinced that when we sit around that judgment seat and start to give an account and God start to open up some things, some people are, go, who are up front. Some people who take the envelope and say, say, say let me give this pledge of 100,000. 
I mean, we're happy for it because it's doing work. A pledge of this and some people who are doing that and everybody is applauding them. Oh, what a great man or what a great lady. Or... Be very careful because you do have some that are under the quiet and they come and they slip it in and say, don't call my name. They come and they slip it in and say, no, 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 no. Just put it into that thing and, and get the food bank expanded. And they're so quiet and discreet about it. Nobody, that's what Jesus wants. That's what he's looking for. And I, 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 I am convinced that when we stand before God, some people that were no names, some folks that nobody knew about, some folks that we see that were so quiet in their seat and we just figure that they're not doing anything. Yeah, they might be in a ministry, but they, they're just not on the upfront side. I believe on that day when we see the rewards that some people are going to get that are what we would call no-named people because they are just out of the limelight. That day is going to declare that they were the champions after all. That they were the powerful ones after all. That they were the real heavy lifters after all. Because it is really the things that are done quietly. That does not have the eyes of everybody. That is precious in the sight of God. He's seeing it. And he's saying that is what makes it so great. You know, can nobody see but God. So in other words, you're doing this thing to please God. And not to show off on men. And this is what God is going to be looking for. So our joyful acceptance of injustice. Our financial generosity. Our hospitality. And kindness. Be kind one to another. Visit and call when we know not just our brethren but others because it's not only saved people that get sick that he wants us to visit, you know. It is our brothers as part of the human family. And he's going to say three things and these are sure things that he is going to be looking at when he judges us. So let's go back to the slide and we go to the fourth one. And the fourth one is our spiritual disciplines. And believe it or not, he is going to be looking at our spiritual discipline. Yes, now, so I hope you're making note because we're going to have to go back to these things and make sure that we understand what exactly it is so that we can position ourselves and, and make sure that we have it in place and have it in place properly. Now, the Jews had three spiritual disciplines that they habitually practiced. If we look at the Jewish custom, we know that all Jews everywhere, uh, they had this thing about them that there were certain times of prayer. You had certain prayer hours. And they set aside wherever they were, whoever they are, once they are genuine Jews and they appreciate what was in the word, they know that there are some hours of prayer. They, and the more spiritual ones know that there are certain watches. There are certain times when they go down and they pray and they watch. And they call it a uh, certain hour of prayer. And um, it was, it was something consistent. It was something that was a part of their daily living as a Jew. So prayer was one. Another one was the giving of alms. They give constantly. It was required of them because God was always concerned about the needy and the poor that was in their midst. So that those that had, and you didn't have to be a rich person to give. Once you have something, you were called upon to help somebody else. And it's one of the things that personally I try to do, and I know folks try. Sometimes you go to the place to buy a patty, you might see some little folks out there, and you have to pray and ask God to help you. Because, know, you know, folks just hang around all the time, but you do have genuine hungry folks that are there sometimes. And sometimes you might have money to buy three patty, and you alone eat off the three of them. Maybe you can still buy the three patty, but 
this time eat two and give away one. You will be surprised what it does. And don't even look at what it does to you. But of course, it's going to do something to you. You're going to feel like you're a kind person. And if, if it allows you to feel that way so you can give to others, so be it. But don't look at the gratification that you get. Look at what it does as it relates to pleasing God. Because that is an important part of the things that we do. It must please God. And we must have that attitude that we are doing it to please God. Ask, ask him, God, how can in doing this I bring glory to your name? And I am submitting to us as children of God, you know, that in our daily lives, the simple things that we do, we must make sure that we introspect and pray, God, let this bring glory to your name. Let this be a, a blessing to this person so that you can be glorified. I don't think we take our Christianity the way that it ought to be take, taken. As we learn these things, brethren, beloved, let us apply them. Another one of the spiritual disciplines was fasting so that every real Jew that was orthodox and understand what was required of them know that they are to give alms and they are to be in prayer and they are to be in fasting. And, but the thing about it is that these were things that were required that when we do them, people would normally go into their closets and pray. And when people are fasting and were called upon to fast, folks would be fasting and nobody would know. But over time, over time, what started to happen in Israel, and this is the Pharisees and the, 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 the part that is bad because folks now take what was a normal uh, spiritual discipline that should be done in private between God and man. And they took it and they turned it around. So after a while, the prayers were open and done in public places. People, when they were fasting, they were fasting so that others can see that they were fasting. So that they can say, oh, this is a righteous man. Look how many days he has been fasting. Look, as they look at you, they know that you're fasting. And folks were actually doing these things that people can see them and consider them to be spiritual. I'm so, and then also the part about giving. Folks were giving that people can see them and see that, oh, this is a great member of society. Look how he gives to the poor and all of that and what was set up that should have brought glory to God was actually bringing glory to men how did that happen they were doing these things that people would see them and recognize them as great bastions of the community but Jesus warned that these things should not be exercised publicly to be seen of men Jesus literally warned that. Yes, he did. And he, he, he wanted them to understand. He wanted them to be clear in their mind. Those who do these things to look good have their reward in full. St. Matthew chapter 16 and, and verse 15 is, is, is an important scripture there. They have their reward. In other words, without even turning to it, we can turn to it at another time as you're going through on your own. Jesus was saying to them, look, so you give and everybody see that you give. And you, you go make it known that, boy, you, you know I give $50,000. I give a million dollars. I, I, give, I give half a million US dollars. Or I give a wedge of gold. And everybody say, oh my God, look at what those folks did to, 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 to church. For the kingdom. Look at how those folks pray. When the man they stand up to pray, is all three hours them praying for, oh my God, this man is a prophet. And we do these things for people to know. And Jesus is saying, you do it and you're publicizing it. There's nothing wrong if you're called upon to give a public prayer because you're called and you're praying. But if every time you go around a corner, you stop and you lift your hand right out there and you're carrying on for people to see you and call you holy, okay, they call you holy and they call you righteous man. That's your reward. Jesus is saying that for him, for him, it is different. He wants, when you give alms, do not let your left hand know 
what your right hand is doing. That your arms may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So he's saying that about the giving now, you know. So, and he said it about each one of these spiritual discipline. So for those that give, hear what is happening. When you give, be humble about it. Don't make you right and know what you let. In other words, you don't have to go publicize it. He's saying, do it discreetly. He's saying, do it in secret. And then your father who sees in secret, what did it say, saints of God? Will repay you. It's the same thing, will reward you. The reward is going to come. And in other scriptures, he talks about the reward you're going to get it in heaven. In other words, it's not necessary that you're going to be rewarded here. But the reward will come at the appropriate time. And for those who are faithful in terms of the spiritual disciplines, see it here. If you're giving, be humble about it. Give discreetly and secretly. And your Father will repay. The next discipline the next discipline is when you pray Matthew 6 verse 6 hear what Jesus said now so remember we just said the Jews had some spiritual disciplines giving alms prayer and fasting the one we look at just before this was giving alms what did Jesus say when you give your alms do it quietly discreetly your father who sees in secret will repay you that's for arms. But now Jesus is saying the same thing in Matthew 6 and verse 6. But you, when you pray, go into your closet. Go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will repay you. We are going to be repaid for our discipline and our consistency. We are going to be repaid for our faithfulness in prayer and in giving. And God has made it explicitly clear right here. And then, then there is the, the, the discipline of fasting. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. So that you may be seen, so that you may not be seen fasting by men, but by your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will repay you, brethren beloved, is looking at us and is looking at our spiritual discipline. This is what he's looking for. You know? We are going to stand before him and he's going to be looking for how we organized ourselves and how disciplined we were when it comes to these spiritual things. Fasting and prayer and giving, he requires these things. And he's going to reward us for our diligence in executing these spiritual disciplines, saints of God, it is serious. So we're going to stand before him. So it's not just in the giving. It's not just in, in the time, although this is a part of time, because when he asks us how we spent our time, this is going to play a part in it, because we, every one of us have 24 hours in the day. Pastor Daly don't have more. The saint who just got saved don't have less. We all have 24 hours in the day. How do we manage that 24 hours? What do time do we give to prayer and to fasting? Oh yes, we, we, we come into inheritance and we come into funds. How do we give alms? It is one of the things that was a requirement to give to the needy. How do we give? If we're not sure what to do, it, of course, it's something we're going to be dealing with in a little while because we will be having the food bank and we will be having other things in terms of ministry to people that are in need. But we all need to invest into the kingdom and, and make sure that we are doing it with the right 
attitude and the right motive. We are saying all of the saints of God because it is possible. And Jesus started and, and made it abundantly clear. It is possible to succeed in the eyes of man and fail in the eyes of God. And I want all of us to bear it because sometimes we are of the impression some, that, oh, I'm doing good and we are marking ourselves and we're giving ourselves high grade because we give $20,000 and because we fast three days this week and we're giving ourselves high grade. But we must be very careful and hope because sometimes we fast three times for the week and you know, we sit and we talk and say, look, you know, I take this thing seriously. You know, it's three times a week I fast. You know, and sometimes it's seven days every month I do a seven days and we're telling the whole world quietly, but everybody. So we don't go over the mic and say it, but we meet with our little group of three and we tell them. We meet with the next group of three. So we're quietly telling them, but we're telling everybody. And I want us to understand, saints of God, look at how Jesus puts it. Look at what he, is, he requires for us to be discreet. And whatever we are doing, do it secretly. He delights in this. And this is how our reward is going to be sure. And our reward is going to be rewarding, if we can put it in those terms. Yes, if we serve to be seen of men we will be rewarded by men. Yes, I want to say it again. If we, if we serve to be seen by men, we will be rewarded by them. And so the point is, we are rewarded by the person whose praise we seek. It means that if we're doing things for men to see us, for pastors to see me, for leaders to see me, and are doing things that the church know that I'm a great prophet, so that we can be of esteem in the eyes of men, you got your reward. Because you're doing it to be seen of men. And they see you. And they applaud you. That's the reward. But remember, we are all going to leave here. And once we are in the church, we are going to be raptured. When we get there and we sit down, we are going to stand before the King of Kings. And if we did what we did to be seen of men, they would have seen us already and would have rewarded us. And so what reward would have come to us from the Lord would have passed because we got it already while we were here on earth. I'm going to have to wrap up for today because the time is upon us. But the fifth one would have been faithfulness in our vocation. Faithfulness in our vocation. And I'm wrapping up quick. We might not even get to finish this. But I just want to say this to us. Most of us are into jobs that we do not like. Yes, we are in jobs that we are forced to take it because <coughs> we have no alternative. And where we are, the pay is small. Where we are, uh, it's just frustrating. Everything is wrong. They carry news on me. They're looking to, they're looking to fire me. They're looking to demote me. You feel uncomfortable when you reach there. And every single thing is just off track. And yet we are in that particular job. The question is, should, should I just... One day, just go up to the manager and just tell him my mind and tell them my mind. How do I do that? What do I do? Because I am just frustrated. Now, you might be surprised at the answer that the Lord has for us. But it is important for us to recognize and to understand and to know that Jesus, even in the frustrating job, until a better one comes, even in the job that is so frustrating, You'd be surprised to know what the Lord requires of us to do. If we go back into Paul's time, and we, we went back a little earlier, where the Roman Empire was concerned, where they had no rights, they had no chance of promotion, there was no court justice, there was nothing going on for any of the folks that were a part of that society. 
anything that they were doing, anything that were, they were involved in, they were, they were just at the mercy of the Roman leadership. And it was a tough time, a tough day. And yet Paul wrote to the saints that were there in that era. And he was talking to the church at Colossae now. And he wrote that they should serve their masters or their supervisors or their heads or whatever it was that, you know, the person that were in charge of them where they worked or where they had their livelihood. That they should serve them as if they were serving Christ. Now that's a hard pill to swallow. But that's what Paul said. He said, servants, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with, this, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. He's not talking about church work, no, you know. He's talking about the servants who are the servants of the, the Roman masters. They're doing their work, but this, the masters were, the, and that's why he called them servants, because they treated them as such. And it's not that Paul was out of sync with what was happening there, but he knew that as an apostle, he had to preach both to those that were under the, the, the heavy load and those who, who were putting the heavy load on. And he was preaching, if you notice that Paul was actually at one point in the presence of King Agrippa talking to him about this gospel. He was actually sent off to, to Rome to see Caesar at one point. He had those opportunities and he spoke to the leaders who was put a heavy burden on the people and frustrated them. And, but he also spoke to those who were being frustrated. So he was very aware of what their circumstances were. And yet, Paul wrote to the Colossians, and he said, Wherefore, whatever you do, do your work heartily, as unto the Lord, or for the Lord rather than men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. And then here's how he finishes it. It is the Lord Jesus Christ whom you serve. So Paul was saying to people who were in their secular environment, although it is rough and all of these things happening and I'm talking to you now as servants, do your work well and do it as if you're doing it to the Lord. And you hear what he said because he ultimately is going to be the one that will pay you or reward you. So when we get there, when we get there, he is there for, and it's a hard pill to swallow, but it is word. He's saying, do it as if you're doing it unto the Lord. And this is our secular work. So brethren, beloved, because you work there and they're underpaying you, you go when you feel like. We do one hour work and then we go hide for the other seven hours. It's a frustrating place. So I just turn up, take my name, and then I find a place and sit for the, other, for the rest of the time. We are going to be called upon by the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he said, do it as if you're doing it unto me because I am going to pay you. Now, when is he going to pay? It's not now. Because your work is paying you now. But Paul is saying that if in doing the thing, even though you're under pressure, even though you are not being fulfilled, it's an unfulfilling job, even though you're underpaid, and, and Paul is not unaware of all the problems, as I said, the, the folks who are going through, but he said, even in this vocation, servants, do it well. Do it heartily. Do it as unto the Lord. It's a hard one. But he's going to call upon us on that day to inquire how we treated with these. And these are our vocational things. This is the job where you work. This is the business that you have. 
He said, do it like you're doing it for the Lord. If you were doing it for the Lord, would you shorthand it? If you were doing it for the Lord, would you, would you sign in for eight hours but you only work one? If you were doing it for the Lord, would you go around the corner and gripe and, and plan and swear so you're going to do something to the, to the boss because him, him not doing this and him, 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 him carrying people around you or you're carrying, doing things around you? Would you do it knowing that it is the Lord you're really doing it for? That is how we need to treat the job that we are in. That's what the Bible calls upon. Secular thing it is, but do it as if you are doing it to the Lord. Because something is happening there. It might, it might not be good for us in terms of how we feel. It might not be good for us in terms of our own fulfillment. However, is it or does it always have to be about us? And that's why I said before, everything that we do, there are some questions that we must ask. Is this bringing praise and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ? I submit to you that even in our vocation, we must treat it and do it as unto the Lord because we are going to be called upon to give an account for how we treated with the secular jobs and the secular careers and the secular environment in which we do business and we will be rewarded for faithfully executing our jobs even in an environment that we do not like and that we do not appreciate. We're going to have to stop it here for this evening but we looked at five of the things and there are five more to go. And we are go as we go through, we're going to take the time and we're going to look at the scriptures. Because every one of them, he says, has a reward. A reward for those who give me some water to drink. A reward for those who pray and fast and give alms in secret. They all have the rewards. The rewards are not here. But they will come at a certain time. And there's only one time that is going to come outside of this life. When we are going to call to receive rewards. And it's going to be at the white throne judge, at the judgment seat of Christ, sorry. And when we get there, these things that he will have been looking for is going to come up. And we will have to give an account. We will be judged. We pick it up, God's willing, next week. And so we close for the evening. Let us pray. Father, we bless your great name. We give you thanks, mighty God. And thank you for your word again that we have shared this evening. I pray that you will help all of us to look deeply in the words, take the time out and go over and over and over until they form a part of our consciousness and a part of our lives. Help us to organize ourselves and align ourselves with your word so that when that day come, we will joyfully come and stand before you knowing that we did and tried our best. Help us to do our best. Help us to be strong Christians, especially in these times. Have your own way. Bless abundantly. Let your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you, saints of God. And remember, Manifest comes up, uh, 2023 comes up uh, in July. July 7th and 8th, please spread the word around. Make every effort, those overseas, you've got to be there. And it is going to be a great and powerful experience. We look forward to see all of you. As a part of the plan, the team has put together a GoFundMe account. And you're going to be seeing it very shortly. They're just tying up the loose ends with that. I think they have a, a projection for $100,000. And we want to meet that little target. It's 100,000 US dollars. We ask you to get to it. Spread the word around. By God, we are going to meet the challenge. And we are going to rise to the occasion. But you will be seeing that GoFundMe going up very shortly. But let's continue to pray and keep pushing and trusting that God will make it a right for us. God bless you. Good to have us. And God's willing, next week, Wednesday, same time. In Jesus' name, have a blessed night.